Good morning and welcome to day three of Small Communities Big Solutions Conference. I'm Sarah Payne Scarborough, Associate VP for External Engagement here at Marsh University. Just like Monday and Tuesday of this week, we have an extremely impressive lineup. So let's review some logistics and some important announcements and then get things started. Just a quick shout out to Dr. Dreema Hill, Amy Saunders, and Susie Mullins for their help with yesterday, our health day. It was a wonderful presentation, thoughtful sessions, and really a, a great time had by all. We all learned quite a few things yesterday. So again, we thank the planning committee. It's, it, it is an easy plan in a week of programming. So we thank each and every one of them that has helped put uh, the experts before us this week. We could not do what we do if it wasn't for our loyal sponsors. Our program sponsor is United Bank. We wanna thank AARP West Virginia, we also have Heather Venetter with Appalachian Power in the house today, and you'll hear from Heather in a few minutes. We have West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, Marshall Health, Marshall University Research Corporation, and you will hear from John, Dr. John Marr here in just a minute. And then of course, West Virginia Executive Magazine. We thank all of our sponsors. Today is education day. Don't you already feel just a little bit smarter? Well, we have a great morning session planned. And then our afternoon sessions are just as powerful. They include higher education Chancellor Sarah Tucker and, and State Superintendent Clayton Birch at 1130. We're gonna drill down on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace at 1 p.m and New River CTC experts are leading the panel on why general education matters in regards to workforce preparedness, leadership, and training. So I'm just saying, if you have some other meetings today, you may wanna to try to get out of them and stick with me because it's gonna be an impressive, impressive day. Now we're gonna review our conference rules. One, learn something new. Two, take something back to your community. That's what this conversation is all about. Reminder that you know you have an online portal, wvsolutions.net, that hosts the entire schedule for the week. This is your online program book. Please remember that we are here to discuss West Virginia and here to celebrate. So we need to be constructive and we need to stay positive. I'm still waiting on people to take their photo and use the hashtag WV Solutions and put it on social media for your chance to win $25 gift cards throughout the conference. We'll be announcing several of those tomorrow. This is a great way to highlight the conference, highlight our state, and get people talking about West Virginia. Reminder that today's session, like all sessions, are being recorded. For those of you wanting continuing education credits for today's sessions, please remember to put your name and your email in the chat. That's how we are taking roll. And we all have to try our luck at the game show giveaway at 1115 today. Now I have two returning champions that have won on Monday and Tuesday. We cannot let them win again. So we need you to play along. It's your chance to win a $50 gift card to help you know, with holiday shopping and festivities. $50 goes a long way. Now we're gonna start our program. As a proud daughter of Marshall, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Dr. John Marr is the Director of Research for Marshall, and he's the Executive Director of the Marshall University Research Corporation. John comes from industry, and he understands the importance of higher education, working along the side of business to grow our state's economy. Dr. Marr, we are so very happy for you to join us today, and we want to uh, thank you for your ongoing support of this conference. Welcome. 
Thank, thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Thank, thank you, you all the organizers for putting together such a stimulating and fantastic conference, uh, starting off with our economy, moving on to our health, and here we are in the wheelhouse, our education. You know, this alliance, I was lucky enough to be present at some of the seminal moments in the founding of this alliance. I, I got to help a little bit, and uh, it was really founded on a vision of collaboration. Collaboration, not in any disembodied sense, but in a mechanistic sense, whereby relationships build trust, trust, is the foundation of collaboration. And that collaboration, so solidly based, forms a platform for achievement of results. And I think that's what you're seeing over the course of these last three and a half years in the Alliance for the Economic Development of Southern West Virginia. The Marshall University Research Corporation supports the Alliance because no enterprise is more dedicated and dependent upon the economic development of the region than higher education. We have here assembled today the CEOs of the major not-for-profit educational institutions who are all headquartered right in this region, dedicated to its success. And those CEOs are collaborating actively to align us to produce the results that we need to to advance the region. And this is not just a coincidence. We need those collaborations and that cooperation to implement the actions that are gonna be necessary to deploy the resources that are coming to this re region in the future. So this has been a very virtuous preparation for a very arduous task that is ahead of us. And I commend everybody who's been involved in the Alliance thus far. And I encourage those of you who have not yet participated to, to get engaged and enter into this wonderful collaborative environment. It's my pleasure as an intermediary here to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jerry Gilbert, who brought his expertise in economic development to Marshall and transformed the landscape. So Dr. Gilbert, take it away. Thank you. As you heard, I'm Jerry Gilbert. I'm the outgoing president of Marshall University and I'm pleased to welcome you to and uh, Sarah both have said the Alliance for the Economic Development of Southern West Virginia is all about collaboration and support of the region higher learning. Together, cooperating with each other, we can do more than we can do individually. My philosophy in the formation of the Alliance was to bring people and resources together to serve Southern West Virginia. I want to point out that we have recently added an 11th member to the Alliance, the University of Charleston. Uh, we are pleased that Dr. Marty Roth expressed interest and the presidents welcomed him with open arms. Uh, the Alliance has been in existence since January of 2018 and it has had quite an impact on our region. Our working group headed by Marshal Sarah Payne Scarborough, who is our host here today, uh, has organized around such themes as entrepreneurship and business development, workforce development, tourism, and prevention, addiction, and recovery. One of the big projects each year is this conference, which has grown and has become more successful each year. Uh, there's also online series developed during the pandemic, the 40 Top Virtual Roundtable Series, which I was impressed had over 3,500 participants. Uh, the Alliance has also received a very large state grant to support recovery efforts on eight different campuses. Uh, other activities include the Small Business Survey, an effort to promote internships, and also student leadership development. So you can see just by these brief comments that the Alliance has been very busy over the past three years and continues to grow in impact. Today's program, as you read on your uh, program listing, it will feature a panel of presidents, uh, two sessions on the importance of diversity in the workplace, a discussion of public uh, education and higher education working together, and a panel uh, discussing general ed and career and technical programs. Uh, I think it's a dynamite program today, and I think all of you are going to be 
well served to stay on and participate. So welcome to day three on education. I think it's going to be stimulating and extremely worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you, President Gilbert, and thank you, Dr. Marr. And I will just say that the Alliance couldn't be what it is today without these two, two men that you just heard from. And we appreciate their leadership. It was President Gilbert's vision um, for us to, to you know, collaborate and to come together and everyone, all the presidents, for their ongoing support of the Alliance. And I'm very appreciative. I'll often say, well, I work at Marshall and I'm stationed at Marshall. I believe I work for all the institutions part of the Alliance. Um, and I believe that I work for the state. So thank you, President Gilbert. It's an honor to have you this morning. Thank you, Do uh, Dr. Murray. It's an honor to have you. And we will go ahead and get started with our presidential roundtable. And so with that, we have tapped probably one of the best, I don't wanna get his ego going too strong here, but we have tapped one of the best moderators in the state for this conversation. And he is no stranger to this conversation. Um, he's moderated for a couple years now, but Dr. Bill Bissett, who was with the Huntington Chamber, and he has recently transitioned to Senator Capito's office, working with state um, strategy and economic development initiatives, and he is her senior advisor. So, Dr. Bissett, thank you, welcome, and with your background in higher education, because he was a former chief of staff um, to a president, and, and he really understands, he's the perfect perfect person to moderate this conversation because he understands that the challenge uh -oh. and appreciates industry needs. And so without further ado, Dr. Bill Bissett. Oh, Sarah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, very excited to be here again with this distinguished panel. I know all of you except uh, Presidents Cage and Sachs, but need to get out and see you soon. So my apologies for not reaching out. I've only been on the job uh, now, I think, in week six. So I'll fix that here very soon with both of you because uh, you have nearby institutions. And like all of our presidents, very important institutions to the state of West Virginia. This is a conversation I always enjoy. Um, the connection between what you do on your campus and the importance outside of your campus into what you bring to your communities just cannot be said enough. And uh, that's what I think makes our conversation today so important. I'm gonna start with the uh, obligatory icebreaker question. So please wince now as I say that. But uh, if I could suggest we either use the digital you know, hands or you can raise your hand. Uh, no one is a college president who's a wallflower or shy. So we'll try to get to everybody. But uh, if you can kind of give me a, a hand that, hey, you want to talk, I'll throw to you as quickly as possible. And by the way, President Roth, good to see you, sir. I'm glad you, glad you joined the group. I think that's excellent. My first question is a pretty easy one and one that I, I like to throw out at presidents. You're on an elevator. Someone gets on. It's a prospective student. It's a possible donor. It's a prominent alumnus. What is the one thing you want to tell them what's going on in your institution right now? We'll go around uh, the presidents quickly. But if you would introduce yourself, your institution, and what you would tell them in that brief elevator ride. I know I haven't stunned you all, so. Hands. Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, Bonnie, we'll start with you, ma'am. Okay. Um, I would tell people on my elevator speech, oh, and I'm Bonnie Copenhaver. I'm the president of New River Community and Technical College. And I would tell anybody who wants to listen, being on an elevator or not, that New River is an institution that loves the students it has, not the ones that we wish we had, and that we are working to become a college that is ready for students. And we are not worried about college, about the student being ready for college. That it is our goal to work through those issues. Well said, I love the, uh, whether you want to listen to it or not, uh, that, right. that is exactly the right thing. Now, President Roth, I saw your hand go. Sure, good morning, thanks, Bill. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm always comfortable sharing with any audience um, is our mission. 
And our mission is that we're going to educate each and every student for three things, a life of productive work, enlightened living, and community involvement. And depending on how many floors we're going to ride on that elevator, I can get into a little more detail on any one of those uh, mission pillars. Uh, but that's something that um, I think not only I can speak about, but all of our employees and most of our students uh, would be able to um, uh, recite that mission and talk about the things that uh, they experience here at UC uh, that helps to transform them and uh, prepare them for life after college. Thank you. Uh, President Alderman, fellow doctoral classmate, uh, go ahead. Good morning. How is everyone? I'm Pamela Alderman. I'm the president of Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College. The first thing I would tell someone is uh, community is our middle name. We are part of the communities that we serve, and we want to be out and active in all of our uh, communities and all of our service district in Southern West Virginia. We want you to come to schools, come to Southern, no matter where you are in life, whether you're a recent high school graduate, whether you're a high school student, because we're doing early college academy and dual credit, or if you are someone who has been out into the industry and want to come back for a new career. Uh, we know that the coal industry has uh, been very uh, hard hit. So come back to us and see us and we can help you achieve your dreams and your goals. Awesome. Thanks very much. President Thank Nimitz. You. Can I throw to you over in Lewisburg? Sure, uh, Jim Nemitz, uh, president of the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. It's great to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I would say that uh, WVSOM is a leader in rural, rural health care. Uh, and, you know, we're passionate about serving West Virginia. We serve West Virginia first and foremost. Uh, we're a leader in, in production of physicians for West Virginia. And we're proud of that. We're proud of populating the rural areas of West Virginia with, with quality, caring, competent physicians. We are focused on the student. Education is uh, our, our, our top objective, uh, though you know, research and community engagement is, still, is also very important to us. But it's all about the student. And uh, we have state-of-the-art facilities, a beautiful campus, and statewide presence. And uh, we're proud of what we're doing for West Virginia. Outstanding. Thank you. President Cage, can I throw to you, sir? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Bill. And, and I was going to say we do have a, a strong connection to your office because Senator Capito actually began her career um, as, a, as a member of our faculty. So we are definitely uh, glad to uh, to be here and look forward to inviting you on campus as well uh, very, very soon. But again, as has been said, I am Eric Cage. I've got the privilege of serving as the interim president here at West Virginia State University. And what I would say to uh, prospective students about state is that um, we have a 130 year tradition uh, of providing access, opportunity and success for students uh, in West Virginia and beyond. We really are a small community uh, where we help students achieve their big dreams uh, through excellence in education. Our motto is it starts at state. So we tell folks, students and parents that come to us, we'll meet you where you are, we'll give you the skills that you need, again, to achieve your dreams in whatever field uh, a professional endeavor. So that's, that's our elevator pitch. Awesome, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. President Sachs, can I throw to you? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Casey Sachs. I'm the acting president at Bridge Valley Community and Technical College. It's great to see you all today. Um, I would tell anybody who I get the privilege of talking to in the elevator how excited everyone is at Bridge Valley to serve the Kanawha Valley, that we've got sites in Montgomery and in South Charleston, and so just really happy to be a part of the communities that we're located in. Um, but really proud of how practical our education is. One of the things that I think a lot of folks don't know is our average student, I've been calling her Jessica. She's 30 years old, she's a single mom and she's working at least one part-time job and that's who comes to Bridge Valley. And so we're really excited about helping those students really access education and particularly proud of both our nursing program and engineering technology programs because we have high job placement rates and it's um, really serving the workforce needs that exist in the Valley. Awesome, thank you very much. Thank you. President Boggess, can I throw to you? Sure, I'm Kendra Boggess and I'm the president at Concord University. 
Um, we have a motto too, and I appreciate Eric uh, saying, saying his, um, it's come to learn, go to serve. Um, so we have a very big service component here at Concord and many students who are engaged in service. We are committed to a high quality, excellent education and students are our reason for being. We, we all feel very strongly that our goals are to help young people and, and adults achieve their dreams, become successful in their careers, move on to graduate school. And we have a high number of our students who go on to graduate school. And we have faculty and staff who are here committed to supporting them. So that's, that's kind of a little snapshot. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Dr. Baker in my hometown of Huntington with Mount West. Can I throw to you? Yep. Uh, good morning, Bill. I want everybody to know Bill is one of the first people to welcome me to Huntington. And I've been here now about six months. I should have gone before Dr. Sachs because I also want to tell you about our Jessica. Our Jessica is 27 and she lives in Huntington and is a single mom, right? So it's a similar story. We also have a Trey. Trey lives a bit south of the campus who uh, does not have a family that uh, appreciates college and that we need to create pathways for Trey. But that's part of my elevator speech really does focus on our college needs to be uh, centered on serving our community and addressing community needs. Uh, some of the ones that concern me the most, of, of course, is uh, workforce development, uh, connecting potential students with, with jobs and helping our businesses grow by, by helping them get the right people in the door. Um, secondly, one of our biggest issues that we face, and it's a statewide issue, is developing a workforce uh, that is recruiting or that's, that's sending a statement to our, our country that we are ready for employers to come here. And so we need more educated workforce. And so we're reaching down into the high schools and other community organizations as much as possible to help bridge that gap uh, and to understand that you know, that, that all of this that, that happens at the community college, certificates and degrees, credit, non-credit, is all very, very critical to all of our well-being uh, as it relates to employment and wellness and the, the whole spectrum. So uh, that's our focus. Thanks very much. Thanks to everybody here. I think I've gotten to everybody, but I do want to kind of open it up to a general question. And uh, I, I mention this every year and I hate talking about it. But uh, we have the uh, worst degree attainment in the nation, in West Virginia, which terrifies me. When I, uh, in my former role at the Chamber of Commerce, when I would talk to a prospective employer who wanted to move here, they'd literally say, who am I going to hire? And obviously all of you are charged with fixing this and I wish you Godspeed in your efforts because we have to fix it. And I'm not talking doctoral programs, I'm talking certificate, credential, two year, four year, et cetera, getting them into that post-secondary universe. Talk to me briefly about incoming classes, and I'm going to kind of bring the room down, but then I want you to bring us back up. Uh, I, when I talk to young people today, I hear a uh, undervaluing, if you will, of post-secondary education, concerns about cost, concerns about time. Uh, you mentioned the two students, uh, President Sachs and Baker mentioned about, you know, being a single mom, how am I going to overcome all those hurdles? Uh, I know we've talked in the past, you know, my car breaks down, so I'm quitting school. How do we how do we reinstill that confidence and keep them and get them across that stage? Not an easy question, but one that I think I'm interested in. I hope you are too. Any hands? I had a lawyer one time say that I'll I'll duck or evade the question from here. That's one of my favorite responses to the question. Uh, President Box. Yeah, I think all of us are facing these issues. Um, students are concerned about investing in a higher education. And um, we've spent a lot of time talking to them about the cost. Um, we also have things like a gap fund. So if their car breaks down, we help them. Uh, we feed them. We do lots of other things. But I think the, the broader question, and it has to do with us cooperating and working more closely with business is how to engage businesses and parents in understanding the value. Um, where, where we are in Southern West Virginia and uh, all, all of us, many, many first generation students, they do not understand uh, what a higher education can do for you. And I, I would ask you know, business to help us because 
we are we are speaking and it seems in our own self-interest even if it isn't we all know that it is helpful to students to go on and so you know i would just plead to have the cooperation and work with other other entities uh, to tell our story because it's a great story and all of us who serve in president roles I, I, you know, the best part of our jobs, I would guess, are to go to speak, speak with alumni and see the marvelous things they've done. Uh, sometimes they don't feel like they can do them here in the state of West Virginia, and they have to go somewhere else, but many of them come back. And, you know, I think that's another common theme. It, it just seems to me, you know, we're, we're struggling with there being a belief in higher ed, and it you know, a lot of times we're hearing the wrong message, even you know, even in West Virginia, about its importance, and it is incredibly important. Very well said. Yeah, I, the magnetic pull of Appalachia to bring people back is something I, I usually count on. Uh, President Sachs will kind of go around the horn here, as I see on my screen, and you had your hand up next. Thank you. I think when people ask me about the value of higher education, especially in West Virginia, our state has invested generously in many of our colleges and programs. And so one of the things I like to talk to families and students about, the West Virginia Invest program is fairly new and it's an incredibly well-kept secret, which we need to work on. Um, if students come to CTCs and they study anything that leads to a career, the state will cover the last dollar of their tuition. Um, and so it's a terrific opportunity for students to even start with us and then think about what they might want to do and transfer on to someone else or to go right into the workforce and then think about other ways to come back to education later in their lives. So I like to talk to. All of us need to keep learning and need to keep engaging with education um, and helping people understand that it's building that college going culture in their community and that it's not just you come to Bridge Valley and you're never going to need anything again but you're gonna to come to Bridge Valley and I hope you do that associate's degree in engineering tech and then decide that you wanna to go to state in a couple of years and finish your bachelor's degree so that you can be a, you know, you can have that business degree and then open a business and still stay in this community. And so I think it's the partnerships between each of us that help facilitate that, but that communication too, that we can all do in the community about the value of continuing to go on education. Excellent, excellent. I mean, it's, it's, it's the transforming nature of what you all do. President Nemitz, can I throw to you? Sure. A uh, little different approach. You know, uh, we we you got to start with with your youth. It, you know, you have to inspire people. You know, I think one of the things we really need to do in this state is we need to get out there. We all have a personal responsibility, in fact, to get out there and to interact with young people and inspire them. They need to be inspired. You, we need to bring them to our campuses. And, and show them what the possibilities are. I think, you know, we, 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 we have to create dreams. You know, that's what people need is they need dreams and they gotta be able to, you know, they don't know what they don't know. And so we have to show that to them. I'll give you a good example. Years ago, and we're still doing this program, we do an anatomy enrichment program. In fact, I think it's the longest running anatomy enrichment program in the country. I can't prove that though. But years ago, uh, we would have kids from uh, mainly Southern West Virginia, as far away as Parkersburg, come to WVSOM and we show them anatomy. They're studying anatomy uh, at the high school level and then we're showing them anatomy. And it's it's amazing. I, you know, I, I, I had teachers tell me, she said, Dr. Nemitz, you know, uh, you, 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 you changed people's lives in a period of two hours. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. I said, you know, no, you're the ones that set the seed. I just am watering the seed in, in a way. Um, but here's the thing. So I'll never forget, uh, we, we've done this for years. I'll never forget the teacher who came up to me and she says to me, you know, this was the first year I didn't have to run bake sales to pay for the bus to come to your school. Now there's something wrong with that. You know, there's something wrong with not looking for funds so that teachers can do these types of activities. And, you know, maybe we should be looking at, uh, you know, collaboration 
with our, our state public uh, 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 education system to see if they could provide funds uh, to, to allow students to do these types of activities and to bring them to our campuses. You got to inspire people that that's what we need to do in this state. And we got to show them. So thanks. Yeah. If, if we can get them on campus, we can change their minds. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. Uh, President Roth, can I throw to you, sir? Yeah, any, any thoughts on how we, you have to change West Virginia. How do you do it? Sure, um, I'm really uh, in agreement with everything that's been shared so far. And just one more example in terms of, I think how all of us are thinking about achieving greater outreach into middle schools and high schools to try to raise that level of awareness and understanding of the great career and life-changing opportunities that an education can provide is we've recently worked with both Bridge Valley and Southern uh, on an NSF uh, grant application. Uh, we all know how important uh, STEM um, development is for the state of West Virginia. Cybersecurity in particular is one of those industry sectors where we know there's lots of great job opportunities. Uh, so we've applied for funding that would provide high school students with opportunities to participate in summer boot camps at our uh, institutions and then um, continue uh, doing uh, college level studies and ultimately um, work towards earning a certificate and associate degree. And ultimately, hopefully they would think about uh, continuing on and earning a bachelor's degree. But we know that we need to reach students earlier um, with, uh, with more purpose and with more easy pathways uh, for them to uh, pursue college level uh, education. So very consistent with what uh, Jim shared. And I think all of us are uh, really rethinking um, our outreach, not just to be what we do on our campuses, but what we can do to a broader range of audiences and continue to leverage the opportunities to do virtual and distance learning opportunities uh, so that um, our reach can be extended even further. Awesome. awesome. President Cage, can I throw to you? Um, obviously yes. you're at HBUC, but also um, great many friends are alumni of your institution. Um, yes. You know, I, and I'm sure you deal a lot with non-traditionals as well. We do, Bill, and thank you so much for um, for bringing me into the conversation. You know, what I will say is this, and this hopefully this doesn't sound strange coming from a higher education leader, but what I will say is that um, the truth of the matter is that we are on an unsustainable path as it relates to the cost of a higher education uh, in this country. And I think we as higher education leaders really have to begin having a really uh, intentional conversation about how we hold the line on cost, because my concern is, and we're already seeing it, uh, we're starting to price some of our students out of the market. And I think um, everyone on this call, I know is committed to making sure that we can continue to provide access to our students at West Virginia State. We are proud to have one of the lowest um, tuition rates for four-year public institutions in the state of West Virginia. That's something that uh, we're very, very uh, proud of, with something that we're committed to um, maintaining going forward. However, that come, that does come with uh, some um, repercussions, repercussions in terms of the amount of money we have to, to operate and to do the things that we, we want to do uh, to uh, innovate and, and be able to offer more programs for our students. But I do think we do need to have a reckoning, uh, so to speak, in higher education with respect to cost because we can't continue on the path that we are on now. Uh, additionally, I agree with what's been said by um, Dr. Nimitz and others about uh, bringing students, um, bringing them to higher education, uh, letting them know what the possibilities are. At uh, State, we have a really large dual enrollment program. We've got over 2,000 students who participate, high school students who participate in dual enrollment courses. Uh, they receive credit, obviously, from the university. And it's just one way to introduce them to um, college study and let them know what the possibilities are. So we're really doubling down on that. Um, additionally, uh, one of the benefits that we have is that we are a land-grant institution, um, one of two in the state, obviously, WVU is the other, uh, but as a land-grant institution, that gives us a footprint in all of the 55 counties in the state of West Virginia, and we are really leveraging that footprint to, again, uh, let students and families know about the value of higher education. One of the things we do in the summer is we have uh, summer camps, STEM summer camps, 
but we bring high school students in or we go to them and we let them know, introduce them to STEM and let them know about uh, the incredible opportunities that are exist in this field of study. So it really is about, again, controlling costs, increasing outreach. Well said, it, it, the value proposition, I mean, it makes a lot of sense and inter interesting comments. Uh, President Alderman, I'll throw to you next. Uh, I know when I tried to recruit for Marshall in Southern West Virginia, sometimes I would even find the parents, and I hate to say this, being an impediment and the concern that if they got a degree, they'd leave. And, Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that in your role too. I have. Uh, that is one of the problems you see here in Southern West Virginia. Once the students uh, receive a degree, associate degree, and then matriculate on to a four-year college or university, then parents are concerned that they are going to leave and not come back. Uh, we do know from Southern West Virginia and Appalachian culture that everyone comes back at, at least one time in their life. Uh, and so that does happen, but it's a big concern. We deal with non-traditional students. The majority of our students are non-traditional. I am a non-traditional student. I started as a first-generation college student in my, uh, my household, my, fam my family. So we have to start early. We have to start in middle school. If we don't start in middle school, the students aren't going to have that understanding of what college life is about. And many times it's easier to start at a community college because we are open and we are receptive. We have people here in our communities that are afraid to even cross over the threshold here at Southern just to walk in parents because they're intimidated. We don't want them to be intimidated. So if we can bring these middle school school students into cam onto campus, let them get to know us, let them get, know what we have. And then as we were talking, everyone was talking about uh, the younger students and the dual credit. Well, we're doing early college academy now. This year, we will have three students who will uh, obtain their associate degree prior to getting their diploma in high school. And so if we can do that, provide these associate degrees that will provide them with the academic education where they can transfer to a four-year college or uh, college or university and go ahead and finish their degrees. I think that's what we have to do. We have to provide them that education. We also have to look at what President Gage was talking about with the uh, cost and the transparency of what we charge our students. We can say that our tuition is the lowest in the state or the next lowest in the state. However, let's look at the fees that we are uh, piling onto that. So sometimes we're not uh, you know, very transparent with fees. They're, they're out there, but I think uh, President Sachs is doing a great job trying to roll all of that together. And I'm very happy with what she's doing and I'm going to try to talk to her soon and try to model that because we have to be transparent with fees. Uh, we know everyone's dollar is not going as far as it is now. And so we have to show them, this is how you can ob obtain an associate degree, a baccalaureate degree, a certificate, or a work workforce skill. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank President you. Copier, I realized I called you Bonnie earlier, so 10 demerits for me for that. I'm, ter I'm okay. terribly sorry. But if, That's if all you, right. If, <laughs> That's you, work in, you operate in a contiguous area uh, to President Alderman. Um, Tell me a little about maybe your experience and what you're finding and kind of demystifying what you do and why people need to come to your campus. Well, I think one thing that we have to keep in mind, and especially for a community college student, um, is the word stigma. There is a stigma with going to college. There is an even larger stigma with going to a community college that might be perceived as high school with cigarettes or the 13th grade or not a real college. And, and that stigma piece is my second elevator speech, by the way, um, and talk about that quite a bit that, you know, do not do not say that I do Votech education and, and why I don't like Votech education, why we have to talk about it in a different manner. Um, and so, but you know, and changing that stigma um, and valuing what happens, I think is going to be an ongoing uh, reality for those of us in this part of West Virginia, because that stigma is so culturally interwoven. Um, but I think too, the, the thing that's important is that once we do have somebody, we do our darndest to keep them. 
Um, and because if we can get them in, but then they run off because something didn't work out or didn't work well, or somebody was rude, or they didn't understand the process, couldn't figure something out, then, then we are not doing our due diligence and doing our best to change that culture about going to college and it's okay. Um, New River is embarking on a, a study of wraparound services for students, how we put together something that helps their emotional and mental state, talks about finances, gets tutoring, um, whatever it is, you know, and, and so that these things sort of engulf our students like a blanket and whatever their issue is, we're able to keep them because ultimately the more we all graduate somebody, that culture is going to shift um, and to become a culture that values education or understands why you need some additional education beyond high school in this current day and age. It's fascinating. I, when I think the word blanket, I think of comfort. And when I think of higher education, I think discomfort. Because that's, I mean, that's what the whole idea is you're trying to, you know, I don't want to learn Latin. We well, have to learn Latin or, or whatever I'm learning. You know, it is a strange, you know, doing what we need to do, but also keeping you on that course. I mean, what, what an interesting discussion. President Baker, you've been in other states. I'm sure you've encountered this in other places as well, but maybe compare that to what you're seeing here as a relatively new president here in West Virginia. Uh, th there's definitely different dynamics. One of the things that stands out to me, and I wish I had the exact data point, but during the opioid uh, trials recently, uh, there was posted on Twitter this data point that I think, Bill, I think it was like 60% of our local K through 12 students were being raised by someone other than their parent. And, and so I really love all the comments about, you know, how do we get this current generation to realize that we need them to be trained? they need a college level education. And I'm still processing how that data point impacts that, how that, that cultural shift matters. And I really appreciate all the comments from the other presidents on that topic. One of the, the emphasis for me right now, uh, I've, I've been playing basketball once or twice a week as much as uh, my body will allow me with guys who are 20 years younger than me. And as I'm talking to these guys and I'm meeting them, these are good guys, they're, they're pretty bright. They could be doing quite a bit. Most of them are stuck in jobs that are barely above minimum wage. You know, they bought into this philosophy of you really don't need college. It's not for everybody. And it has led them to basically living barely above poverty if they're fortunate. And so I'm thinking, you know, some of these guys have kids, some of them don't. What does it take for them to go from their current status to being uh, getting benefits to having a career? Um, and it, it takes low risk. You know, they, maybe it's a program that can be completed in a year. Uh, and if, it, if it's at all possible, something that can be designed uh, around their work schedule or possibly even a new job in this field they're receiving training. So we're developing as many programs as we can that focus on that working adult, the working poor. Uh, how do we get them into a career path? And on that avenue, we need employers. We need employers to work with us on that. And we're so grateful when they knock on our door and say, hey, we're going to hire them. They'll be with us half the time. And you have the other two days. We'll make it a 40-hour week. So they'll finish in nine or 10 months uh, with a full degree. We need more of those. And, and we really can't do it without the employers. And so uh, please keep us in mind if you're in that category and you're thinking of this population and how you create pathways for them. Excellent. Excellent. Well, and um, I appreciate your answer, and I'm really fixated on what President Copaver said about the blanket, and I'm going to throw the pre President Nimitz next on this. I don't want to go too far in this, but I know we have economic development or development people on the line. We have, you know, people involved in their community. Talk a little bit about the mental health issues you're seeing, how they differ from what you've seen in the past, how your institution's adjusting that, because I think it's real easy to get narrow focus and look, we do credentials, we graduate people, we get them ready for the next seven lives. We're not a counseling agency, but you are, because that's all going to impact their quality of life as well as their, uh, you know, how well they can be employed. President Emmett, you're obviously in the medical field. How do you see your institution adapting to that? And what are you seeing right now in a post-COVID world, assuming we're post-COVID? Well, I, I would start with saying that, um, you know, I always look for 
the positives within the negative, and you always find them. And, and the thing about mental health is now mental health has been has come to the surface. I mean, we cannot deny it. Um, uh, you know, and 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 so I think more attention and more focus is going to be put on mental health, and that should have happened a long time ago. Uh, the what what COVID, in my opinion, has done is is has accelerated numerous trends, and one of them is the need for uh, you know mental health services for everyone. And you know, it's like the, I remember years ago when I used to counsel students as an associate dean, and there was a real reluctance to go see a counselor. Uh, and 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 I would say to them, you know, not everybody gets a broken leg in their life, but almost everybody faces at some point in their life some kind of mental health issue. Uh, is is my view? That's what I've seen. And and so. And so one, taking the stigma away from mental health is definitely happening. And so now the problem is access to care. And we have a huge problem with access to care and we need to you know, uh, really focus on producing more mental health providers. Um, um, in terms of my students, um, you know, our, you know, the accreditation standards for a medical student is, is huge, and we have to provide 24-hour care for our students uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, both physical care and mental health care. So we we have counselors, we have services, and I think we're we're doing um, a, a pretty good job in that arena. Uh, though I, I will have full disclosure, I have to be biased. I, I'm biased here. My, my daughter is, is, is a counselor and, and that's her passion and that's what she does. And in fact, she works at my institution and she, she, I didn't have anything to do with her hiring. But my point is, is, is that, that I, I've had insight and, um, and, and, the biggest lesson that I learned, one of the biggest lessons I learned last year with the with, with COVID for medical students is the, the real need for co-curricular activities, the need for social interaction and things like that. Final point I want to make, the, the, the other side of it is my employees. I have I have three employees that have just crashed and burned. These are really good people. Um uh, you know. Two have come back after extended leaves, and one probably isn't going to come back. And and that's that's the other side of it is 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 recognizing within your employees that they're under incredible. And I, I know you know this I, I mean, that you're they're under incredible duress. And I'm beginning to wonder: Are we doing enough for our employees? Is is what I'm starting to to realize. So thank you. Very well said. I, I can tell you as somebody that engages a lot with the private sector, exact same thing they're seeing too, and very concerned about, you know, look, I've got 50 employees, I can't create an 800 hotline, you know, to call for counseling, you know, how do I at a small, and, you know, looking at institutions, you know, how do we generate this? But uh, Senator Capita recently spoke to a group of Girl Scouts, and one of them very proudly raised their hands when you, what do you want to do with her? I want to be a counselor. I thought, wow. So, I mean, something's happening there, which I think is interesting. President Copenhagen. I just wanted to add sort of quickly to that because because I think Dr. Nimitz hit all the right points. Um, but we also have to think about, in addition to mental health, those who are in active recovery or those who are in active addiction, um, because those students are on our campus. Um, and, and we cannot, just like with mental health, we do shy away from that. Um, we don't want to talk about addiction. Um, we don't want to talk about people you know that have died um, from their addictions, um, but it is, it, it, it would be another one, it's another one of those pieces in that blanket, but it is very clearly tied, I think, to the mental health of our students and, and even, I'm sure, at some point to employees um, who also have that within their family or, you know, within themselves, and we cannot be afraid to talk about that and bring it to the forefront, just like we do with mental health. Like that's starting to happen. Um, and it's not as terrible to talk about, hey, I'm okay, I'm going to a counselor, 
than it used to be, um, but I, we have a long way to go. And certainly with when you, when you think about substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. I, I always think of my friend, Red Dawson, who was one of the coaches in the, you know, obviously the young thundering herd and wasn't on the plane crash at Marshall, but he always said mental health counseling in his day was someone hitting you on the shoulder and saying, hey, are you okay? Mm -hmm. that, that was all they did in those days. And to see where we've come now, I think is, but you know, as President Emmett says, it feels like we've got a lot further to go. President Roth, can I throw to you? Uh, sure. You know, I think these are really important topics. And one of the things that you know, we've been trying to do here at uh, the University of Charleston is simply just to have more conversations about these important contemporary issues that we're facing in our communities and in our society um, is you know, around the world. And one of the issues, um, one of the things we try to do is just raise everybody's level of awareness and understanding of these issues by having conversations, having panel discussions, um, showing a movie and having you know breakout um, opportunities for small groups just to talk and um, have a safe zone, a safe area uh, where they can share what's on their mind, what they're experiencing, um, what they're seeing in their families and their communities and, and so forth. And by having those conversations, I think it's getting our community just more comfortable about personal uh, reflection, introspection, and it being okay to talk about things. And when a serious event occurs, with, whether it's a societal event around social justice, or it's a kind of a personal issue around personal struggles and anxieties and fears and so forth, um, there they have a sense that, okay, I've heard about this before. I've heard about something similar to this before, and I'm able to have conversations with, with people. I can I could talk to my friend, I can talk to my professor, I can, I can go to the school counselor, and just knowing that there are, there are outlets and what they're experiencing is not necessarily something that only they are experiencing, that others are as well, and that they have a support network um, within their friend network, within their you know academic community, and, and so forth, I think are, are really important. And um, I think the more that we've we've experienced having those types of conversations on campus, um, the less it has created um, significant uh, problems with regard to um, overtaxing our counseling system or um, when a you know major social injustice happens, such as the George Floyd killing, uh, that we have um, a real you know heavy levels of anxiety and unrest, and students and, and employees just being frustrated about um, their you know what they're feeling and how to express it and and how to manage it. Um, so I think just bringing these issues to the fore and having structured programming and conversations about them is really important. Very well, very well said. When people kind of go after faculty and staff, I'm always quick to tell them it's more than just teaching math. You know, that that student interaction, you're, you know, you're learning <clears> for them and that that can be a lifeline in a lot of ways. So very, very well said. Uh, President Bogus, can I throw to you? Sure. Um, I think all of my colleagues have had such great answers. And um, I think I think there's a lot going on. There's so much going on and all of us recognize it as we pivot in every direction uh, in society right now. And there's tremendous uh, tension around those things. Um, and I think having conversations are really good. And I would like to just share, my faculty had their regular huge faculty meeting, like 45, 50 uh, people were on Zoom the other day. And all of them were talking about being more stressed than they've ever been in their lives. And so Jim's point is well taken that um, we have some resources for students. I will say it's inadequate. Um, we have added to our counseling staffs, but this affects everything. It affects your budget. We really have to make a shift beyond just thinking, you know, we need more counselors. It's a whole different way of looking at what we do and what we're responsible for. And I think we're all trying to make that adaptation. And again, a lot of this does begin with budgets and finding ways to meet the needs of so many people, not just our students, but our faculty, because, you know, we hope we're through COVID, but we're not quite through it. And there's going to be, um, I think there's going to be uh, tension for a long time around that, even as we try to work through it. I, I just don't think that's going to go away in people's minds yet. 
Well, as presidents, you're definitely not on an island with this issue. I think, like I right. said, the private sector, the public sector, I think we're all wrestling with this. And um, again, I always go back to red and someone hitting you, you're okay, right? Yeah, I'm fine when you're not. And that's, that's a very scary proposition. I'm gonna try to lighten the mood a little bit and talk about a puzzle that I could never figure out in higher education, which frustrated me. And it kind of goes back to President Nimitz trying to get you know people to understand medicine and the human condition and the non-traditional single moms that President Sachs and Baker spent you know, on all your students. But everything I keep reading is engagement outside of the classroom, the extracurriculars, all those contacts. And I'm busy working two jobs. I'm busy doing everything I'm doing. I'm studying for that you know, anatomy test that I still can't figure out. But you expect me to be part of a club somewhere on campus. But a, a lot of the research suggests that if I am part of something else that ties me to that institution, that's another thing that keeps me there. Uh, ROTC and student government is that thing for me that made me fall in love with Marshall. How do you help them deal with all the stuff they're dealing with, this tremendous stress, but still be part of some kind of social group on campus that, you know, whether it's a you know, fraternity or sorority, whether it's, you know, some type of academic engagement, how do you get them to balance all that when, look, all I want to do is get across that stage, get, a, get, get my certificate and go on to a special. President Sachs. Thanks. So we actually try to make it really relevant to work. Um, one of the programs that I'm incredibly proud of at the community colleges is our learn and earn program. So we match wages with local employers so that we can get students into real occupational experiences. And so they're getting that real workforce experience um, and we're splitting the wages. And so it's a commitment from the college and we have someone who works with the students and make sure that the placement is a good placement and it's relevant to what their program of study is. Um, but the connection that we're hoping them form is a connection to a workplace. And one of the things we've seen with those students is they're more likely to stay with those employers. They're more likely to complete with our institutions. And so the connection for us is really that practical one because where students come to us, they're saying, we need it to be for work. We need, we need this to be a really practical learning experience. And we definitely have some really fun student clubs and those student activities that you're talking about, but um, we're not what your experience was at Marshall. That's just not sort of our reality at Bridge Valley. And so I'm glad that exists and I want it to exist, but the students who I find that are really engaged are engaged with Toyota and they're going up to Toyota two or three days a week to work their shift. And then they come here for the classroom component of that education. And so for us, it looks a little bit different, but it's something I'm incredibly proud of. Great, great answer. In, in, in no way comparing the two, but more that's, and I'm sure Toyota appreciates that relationship too, of course. Absolutely. President Boggs? Yes, um, I like your answer a lot, Casey. I, I will say it's different on a residential campus, and we do have to keep people engaged. And so we have things like intramurals that many students are are interested in. We started esports program, and I have to say that's been incredibly, um, it's been a, a real generator of interest and many, many of our students, if they're not playing, they go to see uh, folks playing and it keeps them, uh, it keeps them interested and stuff. We also are offering more jobs on campus that have wages that are equivalent to what people can make off campus. If they make that connection with one person on campus who engages them, whether it's in research or, or any other job, they're much more likely uh, to, to finish. I will say that this year I've heard something, I've been here for 38 years, and I heard something I've never heard before from our counselors, and that is our students are having trouble um, being able to focus on their academics because they came back this year after being locked away from COVID for a while, and they're joining 10 organizations and have to be reminded there are classes to attend. So that's something I've never heard before, and it is a little bit lighter. I just thought I'd share. Uh, we're working with those students to get, get them uh, focused or refocused. Excellent. They're starving for that human interaction, though. They I are. It. I they totally are. get it. Uh, President Cage, let me throw to you, sir. Uh, you know, I think I have more of a, instead of, I'm more of an observation and, uh, and rather than a response or answer to this question. And that is, I think what we are seeing uh, around student engagement is 
is, is really emblematic of where we're headed in higher ed education in general. And that is that students are really demanding um, educations that work for them. Uh, they are looking for tailored opportunities that, um, that make sense for their schedules and for their aspirations. So what we are really trying to lean into here at West Virginia State is we're, we're listening. You know, we're inviting students uh, to the table to really understand how they want to engage. Um, you want to engage, um, obviously we know they're engaged uh, online on social media platforms. That certainly is, they're all dig digital natives. So uh, we need to make sure that uh, at the institution, we're doing more to shift our engagement uh, to those platforms. But it, again, it really is, I think, a sign of where we're headed in higher education. I don't, I don't maybe a la carte education is not the right word, but but it really is about building those ecosystems that that work for work for our students. Very well said. President Alderman. Well, I agree with what everyone said. And as with Dr. Sachs, we do deal with our uh, our employers, our students and professional technical programs and our uh, allied health and nursing programs. However, we're trying to base our uh, community service to the communities. And we are looking at what is the needs. We have had food drives. We have had uh, brought in probably four food trucks around the service district giving away a approximately $200,000 worth of free food to our communities. And our students have come out to participate in that. Most recently, we did trunk or treat here on campus and we worked with our employers, uh, our communities, the uh, employers where our students are going for their clinicals or their, for their training. So they came in to help us and students were here. We served over 2,500 people on the Logan campus alone during that trunk or treat a uh, couple of weeks ago. We've also started food pantries on our campuses because food insecurity is a huge need. And we have also provided um, other things. We're looking at uh, coat drives, uh, clothing drives and those types of things. As for the academic honor societies, we put those on Zoom so that more students can participate. So we're doing that as well. Excellent, excellent. President Baker, you're, you're, you're up there on the mountaintop. Uh, what are you seeing as far as extracurriculars, what your students doing and how do you meet those very difficult needs as they kind of race to class, race back to the real world and everything else? Yeah, great comments. Uh, the reality of a commuter campus is just challenging. And we get a few who participate who opt into these programs, but it's just not very many. And so we'll be focusing more and more on engagement in the classroom that, uh, you know, lectures will almost be a bad word, right? That they need to be in there engaging. We call them high impact practices. Service learning, which was mentioned, would be a, certainly a big part of that. And uh, they need that interaction. Now, where it's really difficult for us is we still have students who are not in the class, right? We're still doing what we call a high flex or some of them still at home. And so we don't know how to balance that yet. That's the real big challenge for us next. But this, this focus on uh, engaged learning in the classroom, the foundation for that is relationships. And we know that relationships is what helps them come back, but also develops the outcomes of communication and working in teams. You know, all of those skills that our employers talk about needing. Uh, that they can develop in a communication course, a history course. And uh, that's that's where we're headed. We need, to, we need to be on that. Excellent, excellent. Let me throw to President Nemitz and then I have a question from the chat. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I just wanna echo the, the, um, the focus on community service, I think is a great one. And uh, we do that a lot here at WBSOM as well. And I found, especially during uh, this past year that when we provided <laughs> for students to get involved they, you know it, it really boosted them you know to be able to do something for somebody else and so that that is a great way to engage people and, and connect them and connect them to our communities uh, but I also would say you know the, the thing that really struck me was when we were in our virtual environment and we we went to in person as quickly as we could but but how it was so difficult to do anything related to co-curricular and bringing people together for social interaction. And certainly I, I you know, I, I, that was a huge 
failure in, in terms of my, my campus. And we, you know, I thought the students would figure it out and they didn't seem to figure it out either. Again, they didn't know each other. You know, that first year class, I mean, the second year class did a lot better and the third and fourth year classes did a lot better than that first year class who couldn't connect with each other. And I was really surprised by that. So, I, you know, uh, that's probably a, a topic for another conversation of how, how do you engage students virtually, especially as we move more and more to the trend of online education? Because, you know, some of the issues that you're talking about in terms of cost of education and so forth, you know, certainly could potentially be solved by doing more online uh, so that you eliminate the transportation. Obviously, we have the problem with broadband in our state, and that has to be fixed. Uh, uh, but that I just put it out there that 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 as we move more and more into virtual environments, how do we engage our students and connect our students? Uh, and that also applies to employ employees who now are remote workers for our institution. So I just throw it out there. Thank you. Thank you. President Roth, if you I want to get to the question in the chat, but go ahead, sir. Uh, sure. I just want to build on a point that uh, Jim just made. One of the things that you know, we're seeing is um, kind of a reversing trend where um, because of all of our schools making a, a lot of emphasis, putting a lot of emphasis on professional education and getting students into majors as quickly as possible uh, to give them the most value for their education, what we're finding is it's worthwhile to take a step back and make sure that we are very thoughtful about those first experiences that students can, are going to have in our programs whether it's first year experience in a residential campus or for students that are coming into our online program six times a year, that we're really thoughtful about what that initial experience is going to be like. And really focusing not so much on what they're gonna be studying in their major, but helping them understand the importance of growing their um, emotional intelligence, developing good leadership skills, enhancing their ability to communicate with others. Um, these types of things are really important, and it also gives us that other opportunity to introduce to them the other co-curricular opportunities that the institution offers, shares with them um, the challenges that they might face or their cohorts might face with regard to uh, mental wellness as well as physical wellness and the resources that are available on our campuses. Um, so I think a lot of the things that we've been talking about today um, are things that all of us are wrestling with on our campuses. And one of the things that we're finding is by addressing them head on very early in the uh, students' experiences seems to be paying some good dividends. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, I have a great question in the chat, but it also is kind of a point of contention with me. The question is, are there opportunities where graduates return to your schools to share their experiences, challenges, and successes with current students? And, as a Marshall alumnus, I often hear, you know, I never hear from Marshall. I'm like, well, you know, it's still in the same place and they've got a website and uh, you probably owe them a debt for what they did for you. So you should reach out and get involved. Um, so I get extremely frustrated with the, you know, I never hear, well, you know, it's still there. Um, but it, it is a good point. You've obviously got, and forgive the term, finished product with that graduate. How do you get them to say, look, I did it, you can do it. President Sachs? So 100% yes, we want that and have those opportunities. Um, I think the first thing for us is you can hire other Bridge Valley students and graduates, but that's a really big deal. Um, beyond that, I mean, just yesterday, I had a group of attorneys on campus who were judging a student competition in a paralegal program. And so we had students all dressed up and doing um, some case briefs and figuring out if, you know, if we had a case like this, how would we do the preparation for a law firm? And we had several local attorneys who are committed to and connected to the institution doing the judging. So it's sort of the full spectrum of um, engagement in a classroom, engagement with students on campus. But my first answer and probably most favorite answer is please hire the people who are at school here. Well said, well said. President Gage, I, I have a next door neighbor here at the office who is an extremely proud Washington State graduate and is, you know, very quick to uh, mention that at any occasion. So you've got a proud one next to me, just so you know. Well, thank you so much. I mean, we've we've got uh, over 30,000 alum um, from this great institution. 8,000 of those alum are here in the Kanawha Valley and uh, about 13,000 are across West Virginia. So that's really what I was going to point to is just uh, the strong 
uh, nature of our alumni association, our National Alumni Association. They are really uh, engaged with our students, serving as mentors, providing financial support. So, and I'm sure that all of our institutions can say that as well, but I think that is a wonderful point of intersection to really engage alumni because they are shining examples, ambassadors for the university, which really show our students what is possible through uh, a college education. Well said, well said. President Boggess? Yeah, one of the things we do, um, we, follow, we follow them very closely. Uh, you can't follow them all though. That, that becomes difficult, but we have, in, in, we automatically enroll them in our alumni association. There used to be a, you gotta pay a certain amount every year and that's gone. So we have about 27,000 that we send magazines to. We do a, a four time a year magazine. It includes everything from annual reports to we have a reporter here who calls our alumni. Um, and those that we hear have done things that are very distinguished and we interview them. And those stories are in the magazine. We encourage them to send their stories through that magazine. It's really a good hub. It's very helpful. We also have a mentor network and each of our departments, we have tried very hard to have them set up advisory councils. Um, our, the one in, in our business department has been going on for uh, probably 20 years. And it is, it's you know, an awesome group of people. They move them, they, they make sure they don't stay forever. And we get, we get a range of, of, um, of experience. So those who recently graduated to those who've been out 20 or 30 years and are you know, incredibly accomplished. So those things, and we also, every year we have certain um, events. We have our Founders Day and we invite very special uh, folks to come back. This is our 150th year. As I understand, there's a couple other um, schools that, uh, in West Virginia that this is their 150th year. And we're making a big push to bring those folks back or you know, as many as, as, as are interested in coming back. So along with all of the, and you all do this too, football games and basketball games. And, and those, are, those are points of contact, so. Let me go to President Copenhaver and then we'll close out if we could. Um, just quickly, I, I love what Dr. Sachs said about hiring our own, you know, encouraging people to hire our own. New River actually hires um, a lot of its own graduates. Our whole welding department, with, except for one, is a New River graduate in the past. Um, but community colleges are notoriously terrible at alumni. We don't do alumni for some reason. Um, for our transfer students, we just assume that they're going to attach themselves to their four-year graduate or graduating institution and and we forget to acknowledge the fact that we did get them started and and so we we don't know i mean it, it's hard for us to keep track of them and that is our own fault that is is no one's fault but ours and um and have i've been at other schools where they did a little better job at you know finding their their graduates and our graduates mostly are at home they didn't move across country like a four-year graduate might um, so building up our capacity to handle alumni, I think, is a, sort of a mission critical thing going forward in some ways, because if that's that's who can help get our students hired and that's who can give us money in addition to their four year school um, as a private fundraising effort. Um, because the stigma used to be that community, we didn't ask community college alumni for money because they don't make any money. Well, I can pretty much say those welders are probably making more money than all of us. And to assume that they don't make money is uh, insulting and embarrassing to our graduates. So. Yeah, very well said. Uh, first off, thanks for being part of the Alliance uh, and thanks to your institution for supporting it. I think it's very important that, I mean, Lord, we all know higher education can be silo driven enough, but I think with an institution, it can be silo driven. Uh, as an institution, but this kind of sharing camaraderie, I think is critical. Sarah, thanks for letting me uh, moderate this panel. I always enjoy it, but you're going down in that building and uh, that person gets back on. Close out, if you would, with what you say on the elevator ride down. Who wants to go first? It's pretty hokey, I know, I'm sorry, but it's right. <laughs> President Copenhaver? May I give you an application to apply to my school? <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> President Gage? 
No, I'll just uh, end where I began and say, it starts at state. Bring us your ambition and we will help you achieve your dreams. Awesome, awesome. Look forward to meeting with you soon. President awesome. Elder. Please come and see me. I uh, give you an invitation. I have an open door policy and we will take a tour of the campus or I will meet you on one of our other campuses so that you can apply to Southern. Awesome, great to see you, my friend. President Roth. Here's my business card. If I can answer any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me anytime. I mean, this is this is going so much better than I thought it would. President Boggs. <laughs> Is there anything else we can help you with or anything else you'd like to know about our campus? And I'm like, Marty, I carry the business cards everywhere. So here, please contact me. And I have a basket of chocolate in my open in my front room. So come by anytime. It's there for you. Awesome. Awesome. President Nimitz. No, I would say, you know, how can we help you achieve your dreams? And uh, here's my, here's my, I do the same thing. Here's my card. Don't here's my cell phone. Here's my email. Don't hesitate to get in contact with me. Um, and the, the, the other point about the alums is so important. They are they they are mentors to our students, and we've been doing a mentorship program. Very helpful. Uh, so, thank you, Bill, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bissett, uh, for your moderation, and uh, thank you to all my all the other presidents. You're all fantastic. Oh, that's great. Uh, President Baker. Bill, we have uh, so many conversations with our partners of ideas and, and what we can do and really what we need is execution, which is difficult because we're so understaffed. But that, that closing remarks, we're walking out the elevator is, uh, you know, what is our next step that we're actually going to take? Because uh, we need to turn these great ideas into actions and, and be able to report back on those. Awesome. Very, very good. President Sachs, I think you're, you're, are you, are you our last speaker? I want to make sure I get everybody. It's I think I am. And I just say thank you. It was a pleasure getting to share about Bridge Valley with you. And I hope that you decide to be a part of our institution. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that was about 10 times cooler than I thought it'd be. So that's great. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, President Cage and Sachs, I'll be in touch soon. The rest of you, I think I'll have my cell number anytime we can help let us know. And Sarah, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks again. That was a lot of fun. A big round of applause to our president. See, this is why I love my job. I mean, this is so, it's all about education and inspiration. And we learned a lot um, from this round table and we appreciate the president's support of the Alliance and of the region and of our state of West Virginia. And it's all about developing and implementing West Virginia solutions. That's what this conference is all about, to share the success stories, to engage new ideas, and to network with one another. So thank you, presidents, for carving out time of your busy schedules to, for this impor important conversation. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Have a great Thanksgiving. Now we're going to turn our focus on and a very important topic. When we talk about workforce, when we talk about industry, when we talk about education, we need more conversations around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I am so excited about this next fireside chat conversation. And to get us started and to kind of set the table up for us, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Heather Vanetter, who's the Economic and Business Development Manager for Appalachian Power. Appalachian Power has always been a supporter of Small Communities Big Solutions Conference. Uh, if you know Heather, you know that Heather loves West Virginia and she wants jobs here. And she comes from the development office and she understands industry and she's just a really good person and is here for the right reasons. So Heather, without further ado, take it away. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Perfect, perfect. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, including me. See what I did there? 
um, including me in today's discussion and, well, really just to introduce the two key ladies here to, um, to discuss what's a very important thing. You know, in economic development, we also talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion and diversity of our businesses, diversity of the different industries that we bring to the state, especially our rural communities. Um, there's room for improvement for sure. Uh, when I came on board with AEP back in 2018, the whole being part of um, a group that focused so much on the culture and the diversity and the inclusion was, was pretty new to me, to be honest, especially at this level. And so I have grown to appreciate the, um, the interest that the company takes on its employees. And so I have found value in that. And it's also important for me to share that with uh, companies that are coming in, that we do have a diverse workforce. We do have an inclusive workforce. That's important to companies. And so, Sarah, I just want to say hats off to you all. You guys do a stellar job uh, with these conferences, and I have been able to participate in several years, and so kudos to you. This is fantastic. So, uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our two, um, our two ladies here. They, uh, um, Dr. Kelly Johnson, she's an associate um, university librarian for Marshall University Libraries and Online Learning and uh, head of the Access Services and Outreach. And so with uh, Dr. Johnson's background, I feel that this is a strong position um, with her training and implementation for policy and reviews and updates. This gives her the perfect cross section in today's discussion with uh, diversity and inclusion. And so she's gonna be leading this conversation, this fireside chat uh, with uh, Ms. Janelle Coleman, our Vice President of Community Engagement, Diversity and Inclusion for AEP. And Janelle leads the company's efforts across our AEP's 11 state footprint. And, and through this chat, we're gonna learn more about creating the environment and engagement and having those goals and, and giving back. And um, I see that firsthand. So I'm, gonna, I'm, not, I'm gonna step out of the way and I'm gonna let these two ladies take it off. Ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, Heather. Janelle, I, I'm leave it to you to get us rolling. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, Heather, thank you. Sarah, thank you. Dr. Johnson, thank you. Um, I actually uh, sat in on, on the last panel, just the last few minutes, and it warmed my heart to, uh, to hear all of the discussion about higher education um, in the state of West Virginia. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. I serve on the board of Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, just right, right down the road from you guys. So um, kudos to all the presidents and everyone who is really working uh, daily, tirelessly to educate um, you know, to educate our citizens. So thank you. Um, and and uh, Dr. Johnson, I think we want to have a conversation more than uh, <laughs> more than uh, everyone hearing me kind of go on and on. But let me just say, I am really, really um, honored to to be able to speak to the group today about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it is a journey. We are all on a journey. Um, and I always say, you know, as individual, as an organization, as a company, everyone needs to think about what is their place in DEI? Um, you know, what can I do from where I sit today to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, what can I do as a volunteer? What can I do as a community engagement professional, a DEI professional? And, and that's really the lens and, and kind of the approach of, of where I um, sit as it relates to uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. It's, it's everyone on the field. Um, and we all have to work together to be able to make sure that we are advancing um, and promoting and creating inclusion. Um, that takes work. It takes intentionality. It takes uh, being curious. It takes listening, um, dedication, but most of all, a commitment and accountability. And so, you know, if, if we all, um, I think, approach um, DEI from that, uh, from that vantage point, as a society, we'll just be much better for it. So I will, I will stop there and Dr. Johnson, let you jump in. Oh, please. I mean, I 
I, I was so interested in listening to what you have to say. And I, I love the, the foundation that you set. I think that a lot of times, if this is not, if DEI work is not necessarily something that you thought you were drawn to or that you were actively engaged in, you're kind of um, unsure on where do we start or what does that even mean? So I appreciate the foundation that you laid. You know, it is, it's ongoing. It's not, you know, doing one thing and they're done and, and we've solved that puzzle, um, but it is, it's active and it's ongoing. And so I really, really appreciated um, that you said that. I'm wondering if we want to start off even talking about uh, what we mean when we when we talk about diversity. Um, do you have a working definition that you use or do you have a, a working, um, if somebody came to you and said, you know, what do you mean when you say DEIA? What do you say to them? This so, is going to be me picking your brain because you're the expert. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> so diversity is just that. It's diversity. It is everyone. It's, it's every, it's every person on the planet um, and everything they bring with them uh, through their experiences, through their work, through their interactions with, with everyone that we're, we're all in some way diverse. That's diversity. Um, now there are underrepresented populations under that umbrella. Uh, people of color, um, differently abled people, our LGBTQIA um, uh, population. Um, so, so there are underrepresented groups, um, but I consider everyone uh, to be diverse. When we talk about equity um, and inclusion, equity really is uh, making sure that the systems, policies, procedures that we have in place are set up for everyone to have the opportunity to be successful. So that's what we mean when we talk about equity. Um, and inclusion is going back to that being intentional, right? Being very intentional about making sure that everyone is included um, but that, but we have to create equity in order for people to be able to reach out and, and grab that, that brass ring, right? And so one of the best um, definitions I've, I've heard about diversity and inclusion is, you know, if you think of diversity as being invited to the dance, um, you're, you're invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance, right? Um, and so, and there's a lot of different takes on that, you know, what good is a seat at, a at the table if you don't have a voice when you're at the table? That's inclusion, really being able to be a part of um, decision making, um, of providing thoughts from your perspective, um, to, be, to be able to uh, work towards a greater goal. Again, whether that's from a community perspective, an organizational perspective, or a company perspective. Thank you for that. I know that some of the folks listening in, um, you know, had varying degrees of knowledge of what it is when we're talking about DEIA. So I thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to just keep asking you a question because I really do sure. want to pick your brain. Um, one of the things in our emails back and forth, you talked about creating an environment where everyone has the opportunity to, to thrive. So talking about that, that, uh, equity and inclusion part of it. Can you expand on that? Uh, maybe what, what have you done at AEP to, to create that, uh, that environment? Yeah, yeah, so I will tell you right now, I'm sitting in my home, right? <laughs> sitting in my home office because I started uh, with meetings at 8 a.m. this morning. Uh, being able to meet people where they are um, creating uh, flexibility for sharing, creating an environment, an open, safe environment for people to um, be at their best and to thrive is, is really the crux of equity and inclusion. Um, you know, I, I, I think about, um, you know, how the pandemic forced everyone into this virtual environment 
don't know that we would have um, gotten to this point this fast if it was not for uh, the pandemic, but we figured it out. And we um, have proven that we can work in this environment. You know, my, my uh, kiddos, as I call them, my bonus kids, they're grown, right? But I can't imagine what it was like for a mom or a dad and family all in a house trying to balance um, everything that they're trying to balance with um, travel time, traffic, getting folks off to school, right? All of this, all of the layers that um, we had before the pandemic, and not to say that those layers are removed, but certainly I think for some people, being able to work from home and having the flexibility to work from home probably benefited them greatly um, and, and helped them be more productive. But at the same time, we know that's not for everyone. And so being able to open back up our campuses, our, our uh, company, our organizations, but to give people that choice to be flexible, to be able to bring their, their best selves um, you know, every day to work um, is I believe an exercise of inclusion that we didn't even really know we were, we were doing. Um, and yeah. so that's just, that's just one example. Thank you for that. I, I thought about that quite a bit too, because we we were able to switch at Marshall University quite quite quickly and, and very well um, into that remote environment. And I have to give a shout out to the online learning folks who were able to just, I mean, I know it wasn't flipping a switch. I know it was hours and hours of hard work, but it seemed seamless, you know. So to the IT folks and online learning folks, to be able to make that switch was incredible. But I often wondered, uh, you know, some of my family live um, in Southern West Virginia, Coalfield, and the broadband access is not the same. And so I wondered about some of those unique experiences or the unique uh, situations that we have in Appalachia and in West Virginia, um, where the infrastructure maybe is not the same as, you know, in. Ohio yeah. or and the, the broadband is not there. And so that's like extra hurdles um, that people who are already having to jump over hurdles <laughs> have to jump over. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's exactly that's right. I mean, so the pandemic, you know, not only showed us what we could do, but it showed us what we weren't doing yeah. and who we weren't doing it for. Mm -hmm. um, we have areas in the city of Columbus that don't have broadband. Um, you know, I serve on the board of the YWCA Columbus, and we have um, families living in homeless shelters, and their kiddos had to go to, you know, the parking lot of Panera or Burger King to be able to pick up Wi-Fi in order to, to learn. So going back to that equity piece, Dr. Johnson, we know that that is, a, that is an equity issue. Everyone should have access to uh, the internet, uh, mm -hmm. no matter where they live, no matter what their income level is. And so that is something that we as a society, we have to fix. Really proud that AEP uh, Ohio is part of those conversations um, and AEP uh, in, other tech, in other areas are a part of that conversation as well, because we know as an electricity provider, um, and a provider of lines that we can help, we can help bridge that gap. So, so, but, but that is a great example of an inequity that uh, a light was shined on brightly. We, I think we knew it was there, but the pandemic shined that light brightly to say this, this is not acceptable. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Another point that you had made during our email conversation was uh, the importance of meeting people where they are through engagement. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, so I say that a lot because <laughs> I definitely want people to give me that grace and, mm -hmm. and, and meet me where I am. Um, but really it's in the context of um, the, the learning journey that we are all on. And I believe it's a continuous learning journey related to diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and, and really being curious about um, why people um, feel the way they feel 
um, especially in the, you know, the midst of a pandemic, the midst of um, political tension, the midst of um, the racial um, and social justice issues that we've been experiencing, uh, well, for years and years and years, but that have been brought to the forefront um, over the last couple of years. And so, you know, we're, I'm constantly, whether um, it orchestrated or not, <laughs> in, in these types of conversations. And I think in order for us to learn and really understand why people feel the way they feel, um, why maybe someone has said what they said, um, you know, we need to take a step back and, and, and ask ourselves why and be curious about it. Um, but also, but also that is a way that we learn, that we all learn and, and be able to create these safe spaces to have conversations so that we can bridge a path forward. We're not going to agree on everything, but I definitely think that we can learn from each other and try to build an understanding of where each other is coming from in order to, again, create a path to move forward on some of these really um, critical issues that we have in our community and, and critical issues that we as a business are trying to solve as well. I, I think you hit the nail on the head. If we could listen and commit to being lifelong learners and understand that uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work is not a one and done. This is something that you, if you continuously work on uh, to make sure that we're engaged and we're being the most equitable and inclusive as we possibly can, whether you're a major corporation or you're an institute of higher education or what have you. Um, I actually, there's some Dr. questions. Johnson, I'm, oh, I'm yes. sorry. Well, I just, I saw some uh, questions coming in the chat and I just want to make sure that someone is going to monitor those and we can, we can circle back at some point. I was actually just going to ask you one of these now <laughs> and bring it up for discussion. So great, great minds think alike. Um, so the first thing, uh, the first question states many of the participants uh, on this panel today are on boards that impact our communities. And that actually goes to something we were going to talk about in, in a little bit. So we'll just go ahead and talk about it now. Can you share your thoughts on the impact these boards may have on a community if they don't embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion? And how do we start that discussion if the boards are not having that discussion now? And for, I, I can see that being, you know, boards in terms of, you know, we have a board of governors, we have a board uh, at AEP, but we're also talking about probably, you know, community boards. So, you know, the, uh, a chamber of commerce or um, the city councilors or something like that. So first of all, I would say if those boards are not talking about it, start, start today. Um, because if you're not talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you're not thinking about how diversity, equity, and inclusion impacts your community, your organization, your customer base, um, you have a major blind spot um, that is not going to bode well for where you're trying to go. We are a diverse society um, and, a, and, a, and diverse communities. And so from a, you know, an organizational business imperative, if we're not thinking about how to intersect uh, around cultural competency, around our language, um, around leveraging diverse experiences and perspectives, that's a big miss. Um, and, and, and from a competitive advantage, it's gonna put, put you behind. So definitely start talking about that now, um, especially on the board level. We know that anything related to um, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, community, um, it starts at the top. And, that, and, and setting that example and saying this is a priority um, and, and creating that shadow of leadership for the rest of the organization um, to say, you know, this is something that we need to think about, whether it's within your department, in your unit, or organizational wide. Um, so definitely, that that needs to that needs to start at the top. Was there another part of that question, Dr. Johnson? Did I get all of it? No, I think you got it all. Um, okay. if, if, uh, Heather or Sarah will tell us if we did. <laughs> Just to follow up on what you were saying too, I think that you know, again, how do you start the discussion? Well. 
the important thing is to know that you don't know and to ask for some assistance. And so there are a lot of folks on uh, today's call who are at institutions of higher education. You most likely have someone there who can help. You know, so if you're in uh, um, a business, you can reach out to your local college or university. There might be somebody there who is an expert. Um, I do like to warn people who are new to DEI a work that just because somebody is a part of an underrepresented group doesn't necessarily mean that they are comfortable being the representative of that group or any other group, but there most likely will be somebody with some expertise and knowledge that they'd be willing to share at a large company nearby or at an institution of higher education. So I think that would be a great way to start the discussion too. Reach out and get um, the assistance and support that you might need because it's out there. It's out there, so That's yeah. Exactly. The other thing I wanted to point out too is I think I, I'm not originally from here. I'm from California, so an extremely diverse area. And when I moved to West Virginia or to the Southern Ohio, uh, West Virginia area, I thought it was extremely monochromatic. And I think it's important for people to understand. And I know I'm preaching to the choir in this group, but I try to say this anywhere I go. Oh. You know, Appalachia is very diverse. With we have a rich history, uh, a rich diverse history, and um, I try to be an ambassador of that anytime I leave the area and go speak to other people. So that that's something too. Um, okay, uh, we have another question here, and this is for you, Ms. Coleman. Does AEP have any efforts in supplier diversity, and how can colleges, nonprofits, and businesses create those efforts? Excellent question. We have a, yeah. uh, thank you for that question. We have a robust effort uh, around supplier diversity. We have uh, dedicated staff. Um, it reports up through our chief procurement officer. Um, it's part of our overall DEI strategy. Um, definitely, 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 um, especially with this being around small businesses and economic development, there are so many diverse suppliers out there um, that need an opportunity, that need a shot, that need the door opened for them. Um, oftentimes, they don't know how to access, especially large organizations. They don't know how to access. They don't know where to start. So anything that you can do to remove those barriers and make it easier for people to access the information of how to get their foot in the door would be great. That could simply just be a, a section on your website that says supplier diversity. Um, that could be, you know, uh, going to conferences and meetings and making sure that our small business owners know that, you know, the APs of the world, the Marshall Universities of the world um, have a supplier diversity program and, and welcome them to, um, to have conversations. The other thing I would, you know, just caution against is this incumbency culture, which I know is, it, it can be difficult, um, you know, to, to break through because you find suppliers, they do a good job and you stick with those suppliers, yeah. right? 10, 15, 20 years. But oftentimes that incumbency creates a barrier especially for diverse suppliers to get their foot in the door. So not saying do away with all of your, you know, your long-term suppliers, but create a pathway uh, somehow for new suppliers to be able to access your, um, your organizations. I, I love that you said that because I think that one of the ways that people and uh, institutions get stuck and, and aren't able to move forward is because they get in that, this is the way we've always done it. And you really limit yourself and you're never going to get a diversity of thought or action if, if you stick in that same lane. So to kind of try and expand on what you were saying, thank you so much. Thank you. These, those, those two questions made me um, go back to one of the things we chatted a little, little tiny bit about before, the intersection of DEI and the community. So other ways in which to, that businesses or institutions of higher education can work with and support the community at large, but also those underrepresented, uh, underrepresented communities and members of those communities. Does AEP have um, 
how does AAP uh, go about that? Or do you have any ideas? Do you have any ideas um, for those of us on the call? Yes, thank you. So a couple different ways. We talked about supplier diversity. Because again, that's going to open doors, that's going to um, help uh, small, diverse businesses grow their businesses and quite frankly, create wealth uh, for them, their families, that they can then reinvest back into the communities um, and, and pay that forward, right, in different ways. So that's one way. Um, the other way is through our foundation, the AEP Foundation. Um, last year, we created, well, actually this year, we created a social and racial justice fund. Um, which is a part of the AAP Foundation. And essentially, we distorted dollars and said, hey, we really want to invest in organizations um, on the ground in our communities that are doing work to move forward outcomes in the space of social and racial justice. Um, and, and we're dedicated to doing that, not just this year, but beyond. We're going to distort a portion of our funds to, to work on, um, you know, to support those areas. And then the other way is, again, to your point, Dr. Johnson, rolling up your sleeves um, and getting involved in the community, whether that's serving on nonprofit boards, whether that is, you um, just going out and helping organizations. And I will say in particular, those of you that do sit on boards um, or intersect with an organization, ask the question, hey, what is our DEI platform? What are our DEI efforts? Um, and if you don't have a platform, you know, then start working to, working to create one. Um, oftentimes in um, you know, the, the health and human service space, we have providers um, that are giving services, providing services to communities. And oftentimes those people who are uh, providing those services don't look like the people they're serving. And so being you know, mindful of that, thinking about your representation um, within your workforce, within your organizations and, and those that you're serving, um, it, that is, that is critically important. Um, you know, there oftentimes can be language barriers, there could be cultural barriers. And if you don't have someone who um, is experienced in that, whether they're of that population or not, you can often um, make a misstep, right? And so we want to make sure that we're being mindful of that and how we're showing up and providing any type of services um, to our communities. I, I agree wholeheartedly. You know, a lot of times these things might be, the work might be uncomfortable for some, but if we're mindful uh, in that work, um, we're going to progress. Um, some of the ways in which Marshall University ha has tried to impact and support and uplift the community. So right just a few blocks away is the traditionally African-American uh, neighborhood of Huntington. And there was such a disconnect. And uh, so I really have to give kudos to Dr. Gilbert who reached out. I mean, he didn't just say, yes, there are neighbors, that's wonderful. But he, he didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk and I appreciate that. And I think it set a tone uh, for the university and I've seen a lot more um, interaction between Marshall University and the Fairfield neighborhood that again, you know, we're neighbors, I, I live in the neighborhood and we were just uh, blocks away, but there was such a disconnect. So just um, being mindful of that and making the first steps has really gone so far in repairing that relationship. And we've been able, we established a scholarship, uh, a diversity scholarship. So that's something else that we've done. There's a president's commission on diversity, equity, inclusion on campus. Um, you know, there, uh, we have a, a two-year visiting scholar who is working on recruiting faculty and staff, uh, uh, a diverse faculty and staff. So it's, it's, uh, it doesn't need to be one big bang, mm -hmm. but it needs to be a mindful, concerted effort uh, putting those puzzle pieces together. So thank you so much for that. And, and Dr. Uh, oh. Johnson, I just want to I just want to put a pin on that point because it is so important um, to have action behind your words. Yeah. Um, you know, people 
know what you do and they know what you don't do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I will say, if you don't have anything right now, don't let that deter you. You have to start somewhere. Um, and the actions don't have to be hum humongous and they don't have to have, you know, $50 million behind it. Just, you know, just start somewhere um, and, and continue to try to move forward um, in an actionable way towards whatever you decide to do is, is really important. And, and it will take time, but um, it will be worth it and you will see the results over time. Yeah, it, it's meaningful action, not just action for action's sake or not just words for word's sake. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, so I, let's see, we have a couple other questions in here. So um, let me go ahead and read this one. Some may think that the diversity and inclusion conversation doesn't include white males. So what are your thoughts on this mindset? And how can all individuals play a role in this work? It's an interesting one. The diversity and inclusion conversation definitely includes white males. Uh, definitely includes white males. Um, I would encourage uh, each and every one of you to go out and look at um, the most recent class of our US Congress or the most recent class of our US Senator. Go out and look at the boards of um, many of our companies, many of our institutions definitely includes white males. And we cannot um, move the conversation and the actions, the meaningful actions forward in this space if white males are not at the table, just period, end of sentence, right? I mean, that they, they have to be at the table. And so going back to how do we include everyone and create safe spaces for everyone to um, gain better understanding, learn how they can, um, you know, how they can uh, be a part of the solution is critically important. You know, I often tell, often have told, you know, my, my white male counterparts that, look, there are some rooms that you can walk into and say something that I can't, right? Mm -hmm. And I need to know that you can carry that message because the message needs to be carried because at the end of the day, you know, it's not, I mean, it's important to get the message across. And, and, and if that audience is going to listen to my white male counterpart, whether I like it or not, but the message gets delivered, then that's what's important. Absolutely, absolutely. The other thing I thought of too is that, uh, and I think it's a good time to bring this up, is the concept of intersectionality. And I think that that is often not talked about when we talk about DEI, um, and it is very important. And if you're not familiar with intersectionality, it's the concept that we're more than what, just one thing. That's so right. I'm not just a woman, not just Black. I'm not just a librarian. I'm not just a single parent. I'm all of those things together. And that, that's what makes me. There, I don't know if you've ever seen this, Ms. Coleman, but there is like a, a picture and it's an iceberg and you see where the water ends and then there's all the iceberg underneath so on top are all those things that you can see so you can see my race and you can see my age and you can see sometimes you can see my uh disability but there's all those things underneath that you might not necessarily see you know that there are um so, so that that's a way to think about it too i think that we um sometimes White men feel attacked because we're just, you know, we lump everybody, not me, but some as a society, we lump everybody together. But we remember, we have to remember you're just much more than just a white male. You might be a member of the LGBTQ community. You might be, you know, disabled. You might, uh, you know, have a, 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 a I, I can't think of any other example. Right now. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying. So and, I think and the experiences and, and the experience. Exactly. Exactly. You know, yeah. I, I share with people, I didn't get on a plane until I was 22 years old. I, I didn't know what to expect the first time I flew, right? Um, and, you know, so you, it's just the experiences that you bring in to have someone to be able to fill gaps in 
for you that maybe you have not experienced based on how you grew up, where you came from, your lifestyle. So a absolutely. And I love that iceberg. Um, I love analogy. that iceberg yeah. too. I wish I had it. I'd pop it, you know, pop it up here really quick, <laughs> but I don't have it right here for me. Um, I think we are getting close on time. So I'm going to um, read this last question, which also goes along with something that we were going to talk about, um, about being specific about goals related to DEI. Hopefully we have time for this, Sarah. Um, be helpful for the, the folks on this panel, people who are in business, people who are in government, people who are in higher ed. So, you know, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I often say measure, don't measure just for the sake of measure, right? Figure out what you need to measure, figure out what you want to measure. So whatever your goals are around DEI, those are the things that you should be measuring. Uh, do you want to measure, um, you know, your um, diversity uh, amongst your leadership ranks or faculty? Um, because you need a baseline, you need to start, you need to understand where you are in order to get to where you're going. Um, your supplier diversity, you know, if you're starting at zero, um, but you know your spend is, and I'm making this up, right, obviously $5 million or $10 million, what percentage of that realistically, because you also want to set realistic goals. Um, so you don't set yourself up for failure or feel like you're, you're, you know, you're just not moving forward. What percentage of that do you want to be diverse suppliers and how will you go after that? So that would be my recommendation, figure out what you want to measure first um, and then back into the metrics from there. And I'm gonna add two quick things. Uh, you. For me, it's in the library world when we we measure for improvement. You know, how do we we want to continually be our best selves? We want to continually um, support our students, faculty, and staff in the best possible way. So we measure for improvement. Um, and the last thing I want to uh, leave everybody with, and I see Heather's pop back on, is if you're when in doubt, ask. That's ask. right. Um, as we said before, you know, there are experts in uh, corporate America, there are experts in your institutions of higher education. Um, you know, many folks uh, are, they're just waiting for an email from it. Just send us an email, which actually that reminds me, I have an email to return to a colleague who asked for some advice. So I'll do that <laughs> after the call. But, um, you know, if you do have questions, please ask. Please ask, that's right. Yeah. And thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for uh, having me. It was a wonderful chat. Thank you so much. Hopefully we can continue it one day. Yes, I would love that. Excellent. All right. Thank you, ladies, so much. I um, I really appreciate your time and in the, in the fireside chat. I think there was some great takeaways. I appreciate the, uh, the comments on the goals and, and setting and really know. And uh, I have a big heart for the, um, the iceberg as well. Uh, just uh, as my background, my, I'm a psychology major. So anything that falls into that scope, I, I always love those 10 points. But thank you for your time. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and your experience. And uh, we look forward to hearing more. Sarah, I'll turn it back over to you. Good luck with the conference, the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. I mean, what great information. And Heather, thank you for setting the table for us on that conversation. And Ms. Coleman and Dr. Johnson, we appreciate you very much. Um, now, just a friendly reminder, leave your computers on, leave the link up, cut, take a break, come back here at 11.15. We're going to do a game show giveaway. And again, I have two champions that are popping in. So let's try to knock them off. <laughs> and then a reminder, your um, breakout sessions this afternoon, the chancellor and the superintendent at 1130, different link. One o'clock, we have diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, Dr. Johnson's going to be coming back with Dr. Taylor with Bluefield State College. 
for a panel and we're going to be drilling down on the thoughts um, from this morning. And then at 2.30, don't forget, uh, New River CTC, their professionals are going to be talking about general education, why it matters, uh, to leadership, workforce development. So it's all-star panels. We'll see you back in a few minutes. Thanks so much.